see everybody tonight and welcome to the March 2nd meeting of the Temple Terrace City Council. I'd like to remind everybody to silence your electronic devices. I always like to check mine after saying that. I don't want to be the worst offender. Um, if you would, please stand and join me for the invocation and the Pledge of Allegiance. <clears throat> Lord, we ask your blessings upon our meeting tonight. Grant us wisdom to make the right decisions, compassion to always remember those less fortunate than ourselves, and unity that we may put aside our differences to pursue common goals. We pray tonight for all those affected by the pandemic. May all those impacted by the virus receive healing and comfort. We pray in a special way tonight for former council member Grant Rimby and the entire Rimby family as they mourn the recent loss of their mother Doris. Grant them comfort and peace as they struggle through this difficult time. We ask all these things as one community, united in purpose, and committed to advancing the common good of all. Amen. Amen. We pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. <coughs> Thank you, ladies and gentlemen. We start out our evening tonight with uh, a few proclamations. There's always a lot going on this time of year, and we're very to hap happy to be uh, able to make some of these proclamations. The first one um, is at the request of Council Member Gil Schistler, who has brought this to our attention for Women's History Month. And so, um, Mr. Schistler, would you like to say a few words? Yes, it's, it's my honor to make this recommendation, um, particularly, and not, not just to mention just women's uh, history in general, but the history of our city and uh, the, the, the way it came about between uh, two very strong uh, uh, business women back in that day. It was not that common. So, um, um, again, as I said, I'm proud to offer this and recommend the proclamation. Very good. Well, thank you for bringing it up, Mr. Schuster. We appreciate it. Um, it's a good thing we should have been doing so thank you probably <laughs> so the proclamation reads whereas the United States Congress proclaimed the month of March as Women's History Month in 1987 and has proclaimed the observance each year since and whereas the special appeal of the area of Florida that was to become the city of Temple Terrace was first recognized and capitalized on by Bertha Palmer um, an astute businesswoman who focused many efforts on elevating the status of women. And whereas the development plan for Temple Terrace was also greatly influenced by Maude Fowler, another strong-minded businesswoman, and whereas women of every race, class, and ethnic background have made historic contributions to the growth and strength of our city, state, and country in countless recorded and unrecorded ways, and whereas women have played and continue to play a critical economic, cultural, and social role in every sphere in the life of, Temple, of the city of Temple Terrace and beyond, obviously. Now, therefore, I, Andrew Ross, by the virtue of the authority vested in me as the mayor of the city of Temple Terrace, Florida, do hereby proclaim March 2021 as Women's History Month. And I believe we have Marissa Robinson here from... Uh, Hi, Marissa. Sorry, I probably should have called you up before. I apologize. Uh, Marissa is our Temple Terrace representative to the Hillsborough County Historical Advisory Committee or Council. Um, would you like to say a few words, Marissa? I just want to thank the council members, and I'm honored to accept this proclamation on behalf of Bertha Palmer and Maude Fowler and all the other women that have played a role in Temple Terrace history. Very good, including our council members of present and past. So. Um,
makes my nose run. Am I the only one that does that too? <laughs> so the next is a proclamation for bike month. Um, and Mr. Brenton Mosher from Cutter, the uh, Center for Urban Transportation Research is here. I got it. It took me a minute, but I got it. Um, and so this is for bike month, and I'm proud to read this proclamation. It says, whereas for more than a century, the bicycle has been a utilitarian, economical, and environmentally sound and effective means of personal transportation, recreation, and fitness, and whereas the city of Temple Terrace encourages the use of bicycles as a means of transportation and recognizes bicyclists as legitimate roadway users, and whereas the city of Temple Terrace encourages the increased use of the bicycle, benefiting all citizens by improving air quality, reducing traffic congestion and noise, decreasing the use of and dependence upon finite energy sources and fostering exercises, exercise, and whereas the city of Temple Terrace promotes safe and responsible bicycling and is committed to incorporating the development of bicycle facilities in the vision for revitalizing the city. Now, therefore, I, Andrew Ross, by virtue of the authority vested in me as mayor of the city of Temple Terrace, Florida, do hereby proclaim the month of March 20, 2021 as Bike Month. Brenton, would you like to say a few words? Yes, I'd like to thank the uh, city for having me today. I'm accepting on behalf of Julie Bond, the director of Bike Walk Tampa Bay. We are with the Center for Urban Transportation Research. We are putting together a little virtual event throughout the month of March and you can ride your bike and go and to the rec center and show proof of riding your bike, or you can take a spin class at the rec complex, and you can get a t-shirt or some bike lights or some other goodies that they have provided. And we've also put together a little map of historical markers, and if you go and visit all five historical markers in Temple Terrace, there is an opportunity to be entered into a drawing with the complex as well. So we do encourage everyone to get out and ride your bikes during the month of March and beyond. Of course, I rode my bike here today in honor of Bike Month. And if you do see me or any other bicyclist riding around the city of Temple Terrace as a motorist, please give us three feet or more when passing. Thank you. Thank you, Brenton. And thanks for being here tonight. And, and uh, for those of you in attendance, I have to warn you about the spin class, though. That's uh, <laughs> That will humble you, I'm assured. It will. Next proclamation is for Red Cross Month, and we have Eric Corliss, Regional CEO of the Red Cross, and I see Dr. Ken Dedera has joined him tonight, so welcome to you both gentlemen, if you'd like to approach the podium. Good to see you both back again so soon. Wasn't that long ago? We were no, it wasn't. Um, each year, the President of the United States proclaims March as Red Cross Month, uh, which gives us an opportunity to honor and celebrate the everyday heroes. Um, the tradition of March being declared Red Cross Month began in 1943 with a proclamation from President Franklin Delano Roosevelt, and for more than 75 years, all U.S. presidents have designated this month the same. This March, we're honored to recognize all those who have answered the call to help other to help others under the Red Cross emblem that continues to stand for help and hope during the most challenging of times. Also, this is uh, a good time for, you, we were speaking of Women's History Month too, the Red Cross has started begin by a very noteworthy woman too. So, whereas more than 137 years ago, the American Red Cross was established as a humanitarian organization guided by seven fundamental principles, including humanity, impartiality, and independence, to provide services to those in need regardless of race, religion, gender, 
or citizenship status. It is now one of the largest humanitarian organizations in the world. And whereas, as a humanitarian organization, their mission is to provide relief to people suffering from a disaster and to help them recover, this is achieved with the help of volunteers and the generosity of others. And whereas March is Red Cross Month, a special time to those volunteers and donors who give of their time and resources to help members of the community. And whereas, <clears throat> excuse me, the American Red Cross shelter, feed, and provide emotional support to victims of disasters, supplies about 40% of the nation's blood, teaches skills that saves lives, provides international humanitarian aid, and supports military members and their families. Now, therefore, I, Andrew Ross, by virtue of the authority vested in me as mayor of the city of Temple Terrace, Florida, do hereby proclaim March 2021 as Red Cross Month. So, gentlemen, would you like to say a few words? Doctor, good to see you. Well, we thank you for this uh, honor and proclamation, and we're, uh, we're proud to partner with the city of Temple Terrace as, as we uh, endeavor to take care of the community and help others both locally and nationally. And, we just finished a very busy busy year with many disasters across the country but uh, thank you for honoring uh, the red cross and we look forward to working with you some more thank you for being here mr corliss i couldn't echo, echo better what dr Gadera said but thank you all and, and it's our privilege to serve the community and we look forward to continuing to respond to future disasters and preparing the community for emergencies so that we're more resilient together so thank you again for the recognition thank you, and thank you gentlemen for being here <clears throat> Next item on the agenda is a presentation from the Pepin Academies. I'd like to introduce, um, I always goof up Jeff's last name, so I'll just call him Dr. Jeff. That's how I know him. So this is Dr. Jeff. He is the executive director uh, and a great guy of the, of the Pepin Academies. And, and Monica Perez, the principal, um, good to meet you tonight. Thank you both for being here. And uh, we're all ears. Thank you. Wonderful. So where's the... And where we click to? What's that? So I go over there. Ryan, can you bring? Oh, there we go. Perfect. Good. Uh, mayor, vice mayor, uh, council members, uh, thank you all for for taking the time. Um, I know our time is uh, somewhat limited, appropriately, because you got tons of other things to do. So let me give a quick background on why we ended up here. Um, Pepin Academies is working on a, a larger strategic plan to better serve the educational community. Uh, and when we were doing that plan, we were working with a national strategic planner, and they did a heat map for me of my Tampa campus. And when you looked at that map, there was this glaring hole in the map. And so I zoomed in, and it was Temple Terrace. And that was a bit surprising to me, considering the proximity of our campuses, both in Tampa and Riverview, depending on which way people go to work. Um, we, we, we had a handful, literally, of students in that area. So um, our integrated communications manager reached out to the mayor for us and, and I just began asking simple questions of how can we better serve this community. Um, and, and so we're standing here today with our, our COO and myself to just give you a quick rundown of who we are and, and hopefully open up a line of communication that allows us to ensure that we can best serve students that fit in the population of Pepin Academies. Uh, and so to answer that, we can first start with the, the mission of the school. I don't know how to click this yeah. thing. Okay. You're oh, on the right. Anyway, the mission of the school <laughs> is to 
<laughs> is to serve student to empower students with learning disabilities to maximize their potential in a therapeutic educational environment. All right. Uh, there's a mouthful to that to that mission statement, but the focus really is that for Pepin Academies, we serve students with specific learning disabilities. We focus on the learning issue, not so much the diagnoses that they serve. Uh, you know, I always like to say that we don't do things better or worse than the district's traditional schools. We simply do things differently. And that also includes doing different things differently than our esteemed colleagues at Focus Academy, who focus on a different population, but also as a, as a, a public charter school serve a unique population of student in need. You got that? Does it work now? Yeah. Uh, so Pepin Academies is a 501c3 not-for-profit, independent, tuition-free public charter school. That was fun. Okay. <laughs> it's, it's, it's truly a building-shattering presentation that I'm, I got going on here, huh? <laughs> You're giving Dr. Jeff a stress test here. That's a <laughs> uh, tuition-free, independent, public charter school. Oh, one of the oranges fellows, right? <laughs> That was uh, Bertha Palmer did that. <laughs> <laughs> We're listening. <laughs> We're listening. When, when, when things are ripe, they fall off the trees. <laughs> all good. Um, and we were founded to meet the educational needs of students with specific learning disabilities and learning related disabilities. We'll go through the breakdown of the population in a minute. Um, but Pepin Academies is a 100% ESE school, and we only serve students with individualized education plans. Uh, even though we serve students with IEPs, uh, we are a school that follows the Florida standards. All of our students participate in statewide testing, and we are accredited by Cogni, which was uh, previously advanced ed under the SAX umbrella. We serve about um, 1,160 students right now in grades 3 through 12, and in a transition program for students 18 to 22 to get workforce experience. Uh, we have three campuses, the Tampa campus on East Hillsborough Avenue, the Riverview campus right off of 301, and then a campus in Newport Ritchie uh, in uh, Osteen Road. We just moved to Osteen Road. Um, we've been uh, serving students since 1999, and now I'll pass it over to our newly minted COO to give you the breakdown of who those students are. Thank you. Good evening. Um, our current population um, is made up of about 60% of students um, who have language um, impairments. In addition to that, about 40% of our students have specific uh, learning diagnoses. They also um, have, some of them are higher functioning autism students, and about 25% of them are ADHD. And several students have a combination of, of, of two to three of those disabilities, so kind of overlapping. Um, so it's very rare that a student comes with us with only one diagnosis. As far as our educational environment, um, within the classroom, we have um, all of our students, or teachers, I'm sorry, are ESC certified on top of their subject area certification. Um, our teacher-student ratio is very small for the area. In the elementary, we have 14 to 2 ratio. Um, and then the secondary schools, it's about 13 or 12 to 1. So very small class um, environment. We have learning strategies classes. We also um, want to kind of prepare students for what their post-secondary options are. So at every level, we are focusing on just independent functioning skills, living skills, uh, how to be a citizen in the community. What, you know, what does that look like? So we're not only focusing on the reading, writing, and, and math, but also you know, making them a well-rounded individual. Uh, as far as support services, our students, um, they have the benefit of having a registered nurse on campus. We have mental health counselors. We have about four currently on our campus. We have um, occupational therapists. There's mental health, health therapists. We also have a sensory lab where our occupational therapist works out of. So she doesn't have to commute from school to school. Everything is pretty much all inclusive on our campus. Um, I don't want to say it's a one-stop shop, but it truly is. Everything that you need uh, is embedded in our in our day to day in our environment um, that builds rapport and connection with those students and it's a lot easier for us to really get to know the students and support their individualized needs i can go on and on i don't want to read everything on the powerpoint um, but we also want to make sure that we just point out when we're looking at our students we're looking at the whole child and that goes back to making sure that all these individuals and services are provided on our campus 
belonging leads to learning is a kind of like our motto. Um, we feel that students who come to our school still need to have those experiences that they would have in a traditional school. We don't want them to come to our school and, and lose out on having clubs and proms and we still want them to have those memories and those experiences that we all had growing up. So we do our best to make sure those are incorporated into, um, into our school and into Pepin Academy so they still have those stories to go home and tell their parents and they can still talk to their friends and you know and talk about the, the clubs that they're in and the sports teams that they're involved in so they really feel like they are part of the school culture and they are having those opportunities. Brain targeted teaching model is the kind of the foundation of what we use when we are teaching our children. It's not so much what we teach them but more importantly how you teach it, making sure the environment is comfortable, making sure that they are fed, making sure the lighting is right, just all those things that you walk into a room and in order for you to really focus on what's being said and what's being um, taught, there's a lot of factors that we kind of look at to make sure that that's a welcoming environment. All of this, sorry, I can't breathe. <laughs> Um, it's all scientifically um, proven. So we just kind of take what is the best mode to teach our students and what is the best um, you know, strategies and instructional um, modes to use when we're teaching our students. All of that is, is thought through when we're planning and we are delivering the, the instruction. And that's in every classroom across every campus. And across all campuses also, we kind of operate with a respect, responsibility, and integrity model. The students um, treat students with, with these um, characteristics, and we also make sure that the teachers kind of do the same. So we want to model respect when we're talking to our students. We want to re model responsibility, model integrity. And in the turn, they see you know, adults and, and, and professionals doing this. It becomes part of our norm. It becomes part of our culture. And you kind of feel that and sense that as when you visit our school, you see that and that becomes part of the culture of our program. Oh, preparing students for the future. I'm still on. <laughs> Um, right now we have about 80% of our students are on a standard diploma track, 20% of our students are on access um, diploma track. Same courses, same um, you know, requirements as far as what they have to do for graduation, just the level of instruction can be modified for those students who are access points. But the requirements for them to graduate are still the same and they're mirrored um, to those who are, of those students who are on a standard track. So we have about 80% and a 20% breakdown and that kind of it's kind of where we are, and we, it's been like that over the years. Um, with that being said, we still use that IEP, and the IEP team is part of um, just kind of focusing on each individual child and structuring and targeting what their needs are to prepare them for their post-secondary plans, regardless of what diploma track that they're on. And for those students that don't um, or decide to not take their diploma, they can defer their high school diploma, uh, we do offer a pretty robust transition program. The goal of the transition program is to get students 18 to 22 who don't have a clear path after high school, either a job waiting for them or a college that's accepted them. About 15% of our students get accepted to college. Um, and then a good number, about 20 to 25% are going to have a job waiting for them. But you got to ask the question, now that we got this student with a learned disability through high school, what's left? And if we don't do anything for them, we failed them just as they might have failed before. So we've developed this transition program to ensure that through our mission, we empower young adults with learning disabilities to explore the penalties of vocational pathways and develop independent living skills for a successful transition. That's the neat part of part of this conversation and, and this meeting is that, yes, I'm coming to you to let you all know about Pepin Academies and hope you'll share the information about Pepin Academies if you hear about a, a student with a learned disability. But we've developed great relationships with the cities that we've been in. For example, we work out of the Public Defender's Office in downtown Tampa. That's the main hub for our transition program. We work very closely with the Tampa Police Department and Mayor Castor in the city of Tampa. So, when I see such a void in an area so great as Temple Terrace, I couldn't help but ask the question, what more can we do in that? Uh, and so there was a really twofold piece here. This is a mutual reciprocity of the best relationships I think you can have. When you look at our transition program a little closer, um, is that working? You got it? You got it? Good. Uh, we went too far. That's right. When you look at our transition program a little closer, uh, it began in 2007 at the Public Defender's Office, and then Publix has been a great partner of ours. I think we all know that Publix is so supportive of all individuals and all their unique abilities. They have taken many of our students over the years full-time 
gainful employment. Uh, what we do in this program is provide a, what I call a life skills internship for our students. Uh, they're not only getting workforce experience four days a week in the field, they're also getting a life skills curriculum in the classroom to help put them on that path to be independent how to maintain schedules, read the bus routes, how to balance a checkbook, things that you don't necessarily get in that three through 12 experience, the emotional maturity that might be lacking, we help build to them as well. Every site we go to, so if there are sites in Temple Terrace, I'd love to talk about more what those can look like. Every site we go to, we make sure that we have a job coach with our students. We don't just throw them into the community and say, good luck guys. We keep a job coach with every group of our students so that the employer has a, an intermediary to go to to talk to when they see something that the student's doing poorly, but also has been the case as recently as a student who got a job at Advent Health during the pandemic, they come to the job coach and say, we're interested in that kid, what can we do? So we do about a ratio of seven to one job coach to student. And the way we place the students is by identifying um, through their IEPs, as Monica said, uh, what might be the best placement for them. Coming through that transition program, about 60% of students will end up getting a job. On this, I will not read this slide to you um, verbatim, but you can see the list of prominent supporters of the transition program. Every site that you see on here takes our students and gives them real workforce experience. I see no reason to read verbatim off of a slide, but I did want to give you all some testimonials across our different campuses. Feel free to read them at, their own, at your own leisure. Um, and here's our addresses and our information. Uh, Mayor Ross has my information. I'm happy to continue any discussions, uh, but I, I thought it would maybe be of best interest uh, after saying thank you to leave us some time if you were curious about anything else we might have missed uh, or just wanted to ask any questions in general. But thank you all very thank much. You so much. Thank you, Dr. Jeff. Council members, are there questions? I, I, Council member Abel. I have a question about uh, the transitional program. Yes. So are the students who participate in that, are they paid in experience or do they also get paid uh, with money? They are still considered high school students by the state. So it is part of our just general curricular. So they don't get paid at all. Um, many of them end up getting part-time jobs during the experience. And in the best case scenario, like the Advent Health student I've described, because they've met all the requirements for high school, at any time during the program, they can say, I've decided I want my degree, I'm out. They could be the middle of the year. We literally have their degree. They've just not accepted it. So because it hasn't officially been conferred, they can remain a student and get those extra experiences. At that moment where they say, I'm good, I'm done, we hand them their diploma and they go on to their job. Thank you. Thank you. Other questions? Vice Mayor Donahue. How did you handle the shutdown for your students? I'm sure you had a challenge. I, that's, a, that's the best answer. We're still handling it. I think it's a day to day like any school. I think every school across this, this great country suffered in some ways, right? Um, but certainly with Pepin Academies, there was that interesting additional layer uh, because all 1,160 of our students had an IEP that accommodations had to be met. Uh, and so figuring out how to continue speech and language pathology virtually occupational therapy virtually, uh, figuring out how to teach students in a, co a culinary class virtually became uh, the best model of the ingenuity and creativity that our teachers have. Because there was not a single one of them that was going to hesitate for a minute to not to figure it out. Uh, and, and they did, you know, it's, it's the counseling therapy and counseling has been, um, I'm a child psychologist by training, virtual counseling has been around for decades. Well, virtual occupational therapy is a different story all right it's one thing to watch somebody on a peloton and ride a bike it's another thing to try to learn balance from an occupational therapist uh, but they figured it out we sent them home supplies we sent them home products we sent them home balance equipment and they learned in in this amazing new experience new environment that uh, i cannot credit our teachers enough for we also increased personnel to support the students who were on the um, on the other end. So we may have an assistant in the classroom with the teacher supporting them on those Zoom or Team sessions because it was just it, it was needed. They can do breakout sessions and still have small groups operating at the same time, and then kind of rotate through the you know working with the teacher to help them to make sure they're really grasping those concepts. But it was it was it was a struggle. It was. A, and administratively, you know, the second you had one case, you were quarantining 30, you know, 30 staff and students at once. 
Well, the thing you fail to appreciate in that moment is how all the schedules just get immediately uprooted. And you had your principals and your assistant principals sitting there with, with sheets and charts trying to figure out, now what do we do? Uh, and then I think to the testament of us and I just, you know, the general will of society, we started at about 45% of students come back face to face. And today we're sitting at about 80%. Oh, wow. Uh, and I think that's a credit to all the staff that have put that effort in. Well, thank you for what you do every day. Thank you. Councilmember Schistler. Yes, uh, less of a question, more of a comment, a testimonial. Um, every one of us who lives in Temple Terrace have, have interacted with your students at Publix and <clears throat> through, through, the, through the years that that program has been going on. Mm -hmm. And some of them, they know us, we know them by first name. Um, in addition to that, we have a friend of ours whose, whose son went through the entire program. And I remember from middle school and when he just graduated this last spring, um, and he's in culinary, some, some, some form of culinary training beyond. So the transitional program is phenomenal, and he's doing well. And the, the, the difference between when he started and when he finished, the, the, it's, his, his mother is over the moon with it. Yes. So it, uh, it's, it's, it's a great program that you have, and thank you. Thank you very much. Well, I, I have to tell you, folks, as, as, after going down there, Jeff, Jeff called me and we set it up and I, I went down there and I was figured I'd spend, you know, 30, 45 minutes. I wound up spending quite a long time down there, taking up his, half of his day. And uh, I, I won't repeat everything that he said, but one of the things that struck me besides the culinary and the bike mechanic repair shop and all the different things they had for vocational training was I said Jeff I want to go to the classroom and I went into the classroom a math class is the one I went into and and they let me actually sit in the classroom for you know not for long but for five minutes or so and listen to the teacher um, teach all these kids math you know math's not an uh, intuitive thing <laughs> you know that that takes some uh, takes some work and it was amazing. I mean, she's got a variety of students. Some of them are sitting on Swiss balls. Some of them are sitting on chairs. Some of them are sitting on the floor. Some of them are sitting, whatever works. But they were all, I think that day, doing sets and subsets. And, and uh, like, they're teaching these kids, not just how to fix a bike, but they're teaching these kids real stuff. I mean, this is a, this is a, it was amazing to me. I mean, probably not to you. You guys see it every day, but to me, it was amazing. So. I appreciate it very much. Thank you. Well, thank you both for coming. You. Appreciate you taking the time. I know you've had a long day already, but thank you for coming and sharing information with us. Absolutely. That. And uh, anything we can do to continue working together, uh, I'd love to stay connected and, and advance our relationship in this community, just like we have in Tampa and Riverview. And very good. And Newport Richie over the years. Well, very you. good. We'll talk soon. Appreciate you. Thank All you. Right. Take care. Bye-bye now. <clears throat> Next item on the agenda is... Next item on the agenda is consideration of the minutes from the February 16th council meeting. Motion to approve. Motion to approve the minutes. Second. Is, and a second. Is there discussion, corrections to the minutes? If not, all those in favor signify with aye. 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 The minutes are approved. Next item on the agenda is persons wishing to be heard on items not listed on the agenda or items on the consent agenda. Three minute time limit is imposed on all comments from the public. We do ask that speakers come to the podium uh, and state their name and city of residence. Uh, we'd like to reassure the public that uh, all comments are taken seriously, and although you do not see the directors here, they are uh, watching, and the city manager is here, and we do follow up on all your concerns. I currently have no requests to address the council. Uh, there are members here. Are there any members of the public who wish to address the council? Okay. Next item on the agenda, uh, well, the next item is a consent agenda. Uh, resolution approving the purchase of a 2021 Kohler certified gas generator set. City Manager Stevenson. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. City Council, um, before you this evening is uh, uh, on consent agenda is item 7A. Um, it is a resolution approving the purchase of a 2021 Kohler model KG150 EPA certified gas generator in the amount of $85,988.11 from TAW Power Systems through Sourcewell Cooperative Purchasing. Payment to be uh, provided uh, using funds from account 001-1719-5-2-2-2-2-2-2-2-2-2-2-2-2-2-2-2-2-2-2-2-2-2-2-2-2-2-2-2-2-2-2-2-2-2-2-2-2-2-2-2-2-2-2-2-2-2-2-2
Fiscal year 2021 budget includes funds for this purchase. It's recommended council approve this resolution for purchasing this, uh, this piece of equipment. Okay, this item is on the consent agenda, so is there a motion to approve? Move to approve the consent agenda. Second. Motion and a second. This is a non-discussable motion, I believe, so all those in favor signify with aye. 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 Any opposed? No nays. Congen consent agenda is approved. Next item is the first public hearing and reading of an ordinance amending code section 20-3 to provide for a hearing officer and parking ticket appeal process. <coughs> Open the public hearing. Deputy City Attorney Ernest Mueller will explain. Welcome, Mr. Mueller. Yeah, welcome. We don't often get to see you at our meetings. Good to see you. Thank you. Good evening, Mayor, City Council members. <laughs> Ernest Mueller with the City's Legal Department. And as has been explained this evening, we're presenting to you for first reading an ordinance amending City Code Section 20-3, which deals with parking. Now, the catalyst for making this amendment <coughs> to this code section originated actually from the city's finance department asking about the collection of unpaid parking tickets. So the legal department uh, investigated and learned that there was no longer a process for adjudicating unpaid parking tickets. That previously the parking tickets were adjudicated by the red light camera hearing officer. But as you know, the city's red light camera program was suspended and so with it went the hearing officer and there's no longer a hearing officer to adjudicate the parking ticket cases and as a result the finance department ended up with a backlog of unpaid parking tickets and without that adjudication finance department's not going to be able to send them to a collection agency for collection so before you at section 20-3 want to go through a little bit of what these changes are First, we start by allowing for the appointment of a hearing officer. That appointment will be done by the city council. It's an unpaid appointment. It's a, say that again. It's an unpaid appointment, so it'll be a volunteer. You know, volunteers would apply for it, and you guys and the city council would appoint. Uh, we would set up a procedure for the people who are issued a parking ticket to either a pay the parking ticket to the city, or make a written request for a hearing in front of that hearing officer. If they do not pay the ticket or request a hearing, then the city will notify those, uh, those people that their ticket uh, is gonna be scheduled before the hearing officer, and then if they do not attend on the date of that hearing, that uh, they're, they're gonna move forward, the hearing officer will move forward as a default type of uh, process to adjudicate that uh, parking ticket. Um, we made a few other changes. If you look through there, you'll see that we added some definitions. We tweaked some existing definitions, and then we removed at least one definition there. Um, some existing provisions you'll see are struck through, but they've, some of them have been moved to a different paragraph within section 20-3 and then others were removed. Um, we then uh, asked the city manager and the chief of police to review, and then there were some additional changes made after that that included the allocation of fines uh, that would be received by the city. Uh, uh, we removed uh, areas, uh, sections uh, dealing with the designation of reserved parking and tollway, and uh, actually we made some changes there. I, I, we didn't remove it. and. Uh, we, but we did remove any provisions that were determined no longer necessary. Now, if you pass this ordinance on first reading, I do see a change that needs to be made, um, and it's just a, re a reference section. And it's on the eighth page, and it reads that, uh, the way it reads now is that the person to whom the ticket was issued shall elect one of the actions as set forth in paragraph 8B below it should say 8D, so I can make that change between first and second reading. Um, and if you do choose to pass this ordinance on first reading, I would ask that your motion include that that change be made before second reading. Now, finally, as we look down the road, if you pass the, this um, ordinance on first and second reading, then the city will uh, then get the word out and start accepting applications. 
for hearing officers, and then uh, for with any luck, we can uh, get that to you by April uh, and have you appoint the hearing officer. And I stand for any questions. Prior to questions, are there members of the public who wish to comment on this item? Mr. Bregorlich, please approach. <laughs> David Bregorlich, 1534 North River Hills Drive. <laughs> I was just wondering what the requirements of the hearing officer are. We're, we're, that will, yeah, got it. Anything else, Mr. Bregorlich? That's it. That, that's it? Okay. Yeah. Council member, you have questions for Ms. Dip, for uh, Mr. Sister? Yes, thank you. Um, uh, Thank you, sir. Um, I do have a couple questions. First of all, what do we have? Uh, you may not. You're probably not going to know the answer, Charles. How much do we have outstanding in parking fines? Any clue? I, I don't know. Okay. Okay. Well, kudos to Lynn for bringing that up. <clears throat> uh, my my concerns were: this is going to be some type of like a quasi-judicial position. <laughs> What type of liabilities does this, qualifications was my first question. Second question is, <clears throat> what kind of liability issues will that, will a, a volunteer uh, citizen capacity, could they create for the city? I mean, is there, I, that, that it sounds very wide open and the qualifications would probably limit the number of people who would who would be willing to do it, but I can see us maybe getting into a, a, a legal issue somewhere. And that's a question. Well, I, first of all, as far as qualifications, we haven't set forth any real qualifications other than a willing body that uh, would make an application to you and you would be able to look, uh, you know, look through what their qualifications are. You guys would appoint. We hadn't set anything like requiring it to be an attorney or anything along those lines. Um, it would be, uh, I'm not foreseeing any type of liability issue. This would be the equivalent of what would be a, a code enforcement because it's basically enforcing the parking code, the city's parking code. So uh, it would just be along the lines of a code enforcement special magistrate, but specialized in the parking, parking violations, handling the parking tickets. Council member Chambers. Yes, yeah, so... Uh... So now, uh, police or fire, maybe in fire lanes, or somebody writes a ticket for a parking violation, and it goes where? Nowhere. That is my understanding. I don't know if the chief uh, can address that, but. Not a process. So if they pay their ticket, they pay it. If they don't pay it. It's just kind of sitting there right now. And once we. If, you know, if this passes and we do get this process going and we do get a hearing officer up and running, some of those outstanding parking tickets will be noticed and people will get noticed that they're going to have to be going through the adjudication. So once this is established and a hearing officer rules uh, that the parking ticket is valid and they don't pay it, that would start a different process to how do we collect on that? Well, normally what happens in these, through my experience, has been... Uh, uh, the finance department would then, because we do have an adjudicated parking ticket, that it would go to uh, usually a collection agency for collection. Gotcha. Okay. But I mean, that's up to the finance department how they want to handle that. And it, one more. And at some point before you finish, can you tell us the change you want us to make for the motion? Uh, yes. Yes. Well, um, yes. Because yeah, I didn't write it down fast. <laughs> <laughs> um. It will be in section 20-3-8, paragraph 8, subparagraph A2. And we just need to change the reference to uh, paragraph 8D, <coughs> as in Delta. Paragraph 8-2 is what needs to be revised. Correct. It needs just to make that change from an 8B to an 8D. It's on the eighth page if you have it in front of you. That's right at the top. Council members, other questions? I, I have a, I'm sorry. Um, Council member Abel. I just was going to ask for a little bit more um, clarity. So if we were to have this new <coughs> hearing officer, um, 
looking at the old outstanding parking tickets. Did you say that when they come in, they're, they're not going to have their work cut out for them, that most of that's just going to go to collections? Is that, was that what I heard? The ones that are outstanding? Yes. Some, not all, but some of those, uh, the more recent ones, because I don't think, you know, we'll have to decide how far back we're going to do a look, would then a notice would go out to those, uh, to the people who got those tickets, letting them know that they're, those tickets are going to be set for a hearing and they should appear and, you know, either try and contest the ticket at that point. Um, otherwise, uh, the ticket will get adjudicated and be eligible for collection at that point. So it's probably looking at a more recent time frame for those. I'm sorry. It would probably be looking at a more recent time frame for those. Yeah, and again, I don't know how far back that look back period is going to be two years, I think we said. When we started to look at this with finance, it seemed that there were, you know, they, they could go back 10 years. The problem with going back 10 years to try to collect those is, is that the tickets themselves, which is like the charging document, they were not retained. So we don't have 10 years worth of tickets to go back. We were looking at going back to 2017 <clears throat> because I believe that we have those tickets. The amount of money totals $3,115. But the interesting thing, when I, would, I, I, I got a, uh, Mr. Ingram from Finance sent me a spreadsheet on this. It seems that of these tickets going back to 2017, we're dealing with the prob probably the same dozen people. They have multiple tickets for all sorts of things. So really, to notify those, to notify the people going back three years should not be that hard because there really aren't that many different people to notify. So. Thank you. Any other questions? No, I don't think so. Did that answer your question? Or do you have another? No, I have a follow-up. Follow okay. Mr. Mr. Thank, thank you, Mr. Mayor. I just, I'm, I'm having trouble. What is, the, what is this hearing officer going to do? Is he going to say, you don't have to pay the ticket? You do have to pay the ticket? They're going to, I, I'm, I'm a little confused with that. Well, they would be receiving evidence as to either, A, why the, ticket is incorrect and they shouldn't have been <clears throat> given this parking ticket or one of the um, uh, I guess excuses is the right word or one of the things that might mitigate the the issue of the ticket um, with regard to like handicap sometimes if they come in you know a lot of times there wasn't a, dis a, a tag displayed if they bring in that tag then uh, there there's usually a dismissal on that but there's an admin fee that because we of all the expense we did have and in doing that, there would still be a, an admin fee, but that's like a, a the I think the um, handicap parking ticket's like a two hundred and fifty dollar ticket or something like that. Mm -hmm. So you know if they come in with that tag to show they had it, just didn't have it at the time, then uh, they have the the hearing officer usually has the ability to um, reduce that. I think it's going to be important that when we set this up. We set this up with with a process for that that individual to follow. It seems to me like we're going to have some type of of an evidentiary issue with okay, well, uh, an officer issued a ticket. They don't think they had the ticket, so the officer's got to appear. I don't know. It's just it just seems to me it's going to be a lot of who shot John just to to collect on the tickets when that person really are they going to have the power to reverse it? You know, if they have okay, you have you have a you have a handicap placard. You didn't have it put out. You got a ticket. You bring it in, but I, I don't know. It just seems to me it's creating more of a problem um, with uh, than just sending the tickets to collections. Mm -hmm. You need to have that adjudication. You need to have a. a no matter what happens, we're going to need process that to hearing go to the on next it step. before we can send it out. Well, we're going to have to be very careful how we lay that out. In my opinion. Okay, I'm done. Thank you. I, I have a couple of questions, Mr. Mueller. Um, well, let me start at the beginning. What refresh my memory as to we had a conversation fairly recently about this topic, um, going back and trying to collect old delinquent parking tickets. So, refresh our memories and tell us how this conversation tonight links with that, and how did this whole thing come to light, and how long has it been? Because you you said it was tied to the doing away with red light cameras. Well, that's been a long time. So where's all this been for all this time? How did this come to light? It, it, it came to light because Lynn contacted the legal department and said, how do I collect these 
all these unpaid parking tickets. Okay. And again, she was looking at a, a list 10 years back. Okay. So, so that's how it started. But the problem is she wanted to send them to collections, but you can't send the ticket to collection until somebody has adjudicated the ticket. So what did you tell us a month or two ago that you were going to, you told us that you were doing something. Well, I don't remember what Basically, it was. You we were doing this. Mm -hmm. We were trying to put this together. And instead of just, instead of just launching in and kind of <coughs> reviving what we had before with the red light camera hearing officer because we had been doing this before. So we were reviving basically what we had before, but we also, it forced us to look at the parking ordinance and the city manager looked at the parking ordinance and Chief Albano looked at the parking ordinance and we, they, they all, we all saw things in there that we don't even use anymore that don't exist in the city anymore. So we decided to clean up the whole ordinance at the time. So maybe it looks a little more confusing or, or has a little more in it than just doing a uh, parking ticket enforcement program again. So. Okay. All right. Um, well, my other questions then focus on this kind of the echo, uh, Mr. Schistler. Um, you know, I'm familiar with the traffic court magistrates who aren't really judges they're attorneys they come and function as a magistrate I've been to court many many times for years on that but I, I'm maybe it's just unknown or new to me but I'm a little queasy about just a volunteer I mean but and because even in traffic court you know you're talking fines you're not talking put, putting people in prison you're talking about relatively minor issues but well, it's 250 bucks. That's not minor to some people. They're, the traffic magistrates have some knowledge of, you know, what const, what are the elements of a violation and what are, what is the, ev the rules of evidence, you know, what's admissible and what's just off the wall. And, you know, we struggle with this having um, on our code board, but, you know, because there's seven members of the code board and we have counsel there, you know, it's... It's a little easier to keep this between the buoys, but I, I'm concerned about the qualifications of this. And I don't, you know, I, I'm looking at somebody who's an attorney, and not just any attorney, but an attorney with a particular type of knowledge, background, that those people aren't going to volunteer to do this. I mean, you're not going to get somebody like that to come down here and donate four hours a night to hear parking ticket cases. They're not going to do that. Um, well, we have a lot of... Well, so uh, that's really... I mean, I, I understand. I get it. I, I, I get it. I, we can't collect fines when there's been no due process. People haven't had a right to come down and say, well, I parked in the fire zone because of whatever. Or, you know, I mean, they people deserve due process. That's the law. But I am concerned that if we don't get the right person as acting as a magistrate, this is going to go poorly and, and and keep in mind we will certainly train the person too you know as you said bring you know evidentiary you know teach them to right. take in evidence understand competent substantial evidence you know and, and understand what they can and cannot do but yeah as far as the qualification remember it, this is set up to where city council would appoint you know you'd get yeah, the but application I, mean, I could see this going you get the right person this thing's going to go like butter mm -hmm. You get the wrong person, and we're all going to be jumping in and you know, adjourning I mean, the you... hearing because <laughs> this thing's going really bad. And, and so I don't know, you know, that we're going to know that until that person gets up here. And I and you know, the other thing is sometimes we put these things out, we get one application, and and we, I think, erroneously think because we only got one person that we're stuck with that person whether we like it or not. <clears throat> I don't think that's the case, but that's what we often do is think, well, we only got that person. So, and this is, so anyway, my, I'm, I'm good. I'm just concerned about the qualifications of the magistrate. So. Vice Mayor. Thank you. Is there any reason this could not be set up as a three person uh, <coughs> system so that we are not falling on the judgment call of a citizen? You kind of got to weigh that out. 
Now you got to find the efficiencies. <laughs> when you have, yeah, you know, if, if you have one person, it becomes a very efficient process if they're well trained, they're qualified, they understand what they're doing. Um, you know, as you add more people in, you begin to, you know, the, the process becomes more slowed. Everybody has an opinion. You end up with a vote. Uh, I will say that it's more efficient to have one person do it. Why don't we just hire a qualified attorney and pay them $300 to come in once a month and do these hearings if there's anybody to have hearings for? Yeah, we, we there are probably going to be months with no hearings yeah. at all. Um, I had I had basically more or less volunteered and had been a traffic court magistrate in county court for a number of years. I did it at night after my regular job, and I got paid $20 an hour by the county. <laughs> so, but anyway, so you're talking 300, don't even say that out loud. <laughs> but, um, you know, it, it's, it, it was more of a giving back to the community. But there was specific training that I did receive um, but again, it was just me making the decision. As you know, Tampa uh, code enforcement is done by one special magistrate. So you have one person making the decision that we have seven people making a decision on. Mm -hmm. So it, having one person as a hearing officer isn't out of the ordinary. Um, and and as, as Ernie said, this is just another code violation. Um, they would get the same training that any of our code, uh, our code board members get. Uh, in fact, we could maybe even find a former code board member who would be interested in doing this. So they would, you know, and they would have to, um, I've been recommending that the ethics training and everything that you all take, that our code, all of our board members take that same training. So they would have to do that. Well, I... <coughs> I'm supportive of this because we need to do something. I, but I'd, I'd like, this is just me, I don't know how the rest of the council feels, but I'd like you guys to bat around the idea of let's doing something different about a hearing officer. Let's find out what Tampa pays their special magistrate. If it's by the hour, maybe we pay 50 bucks an hour or whatever. It's because some of it is going to be offset by the income revenue that we're going to get from the parking citation. So it is going to cut into the revenue that we're going to get but i i think we at all i know i will sleep better a little a little bit knowing that we've got somebody up here that is qualified and and is not going to hear stuff they shouldn't be hearing or putting weight on evidence that has you know i these things you know i know it's not a lot of money but you know we toss around oh it's only 250 bucks but to some people that it's an impact on their life. I mean, that's a big thing. We need to get it right. I can tell you um, the city of Tampa does, uh, the, pers the, the special magistrate that does the parking tickets is their red camera, uh, red light camera here, uh, special magistrate. And uh, I can't remember what the cap is, but they, um, I, I don't remember what the cap is, but I'm thinking it's around $180 or something. Okay. For doing that. Are we comfortable to pass this on first reading tonight and maybe second reading might be a little different there might be some changes so, but wait are we did you ask us if we wanted to pass it tonight or we're we're definitely going into a second reading correct yeah there'll be a second okay reading. yeah all right that's what i want to make sure yes this is first reading. in that case i okay now I'm going to close the public hearing and I think James has written everything down. We're going to let him make the if, motion. If there are other questions now, there's time for discussion after I close the hearing, but if you have other questions, now's the time. Well, we asked for public comment. <laughs> Guys, we passed that. Um, um, I'm, a, I'm afraid of allowing that, not because I don't want to hear from you, but I don't want to hear every hearing that we have then i'm afraid that that would become a i'm sorry okay are there other questions for okay i'm going to close the public hearing and ask the clerk to read the title of the ordinance please an ordinance of the city of temple terrace florida amending section 20-3 of the temple terrace code of ordinances by establishing a hearing officer process 
for the appeal and adjudication of parking tickets issued by the Temple Terrace Police Department. The <coughs> violations of Section 20-3, the payment of parking tickets eliminated obsolete language and making other miscellaneous changes, providing for the repeal of ordinances or parts of ordinances in conflict herewith, providing for severability and providing for an effective date. Very well, Council Member Chambers, am I correct that you were prepared to make a motion or did somebody throw you under the bus? Uh, uh, both. <laughs> both to that. I make a motion that we approve the ordinance uh, amending code section 20-3 to provide for a hearing officer and park it parking ticket appeal process also with the change of section 8B to section uh, 8D. Motion, do we have a second? Second. Is there discussion on the motion? Mr. Schistler. Yeah. Um, I, I understand why we're doing this, and I understand that we need to come up with a process to handling this, but I don't think I can support the motion for the, the motion for the to approve it on first reading with just a sole individual as as the hearing officer for uh, for the hearing officer. I think that we need to have three would be a good number. I recognize that there's not that many, and like you said, they may not meet for uh, you know every month. But I think that this is an important thing, and it's going to be. I, I just see creating issues um, in in, uh, in in adjudicating some of these, and uh, I would like to see a change to three. But I, you know, I don't think I can support them. I, the rest of the mo the rest of the changes are fine. I just think it should be a larger body. That's all. Mr. Chambers. Okay. Um, well, I, I do support uh, the motion with uh, one hearing officer. Um, years ago, the recreation staff was authorized to, and trained to write parking tickets, mainly in the fire lanes of the rec center. And I wrote one ticket in my career, had to go to court on that one ticket. And it was done at Hillsborough County at that time. And uh, it was one officer, just one officer for the county. And I think it's still done that way. And I think Tampa is, is one officer. So I'm good with the one officer. Uh, and the ordinance says that it's our designee, so we can pick and choose who we get if we don't like the qualifications of the person that mm -hmm. uh, is brought to us, or we may want to put in, a, in part of discussion, but still a question that we can add a, a, a hourly rate if we wanted to. I guess we could do that. But I do support this uh, motion. Other comments, discussion on the motion? I, I will support it too. I, and I don't think we need a panel of three people. If you go to, I mean, if you go to trial for murder, you get one judge. You don't get, you don't get, you don't get a panel of judges. And, and I, I do think it comes down to having the right person though, and a, yeah. a, a qualified person, and that may cost us. But if we got an attorney, that's who, you know, if you get arrested for, or not arrested, if you get a ticket for speeding, you take it to court. You go before a traffic magistrate who is an attorney. You used to do it, right? I probably was before you at one point. Um, I don't think we need three of those people. We just need somebody that's qualified. But. Okay. Further discussion? If not, all those in favor signify with aye. 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 Opposed? No. Okay. The motion passes. Next item on the agenda is a resolution approving the second mon oh boy. Oh no, this is easier. Okay. Resolution <laughs> approving the second modification of the CARES Act funding agreement between Hillsborough County and the City of Temple Terrace. City Manager Stevenson. Uh, thank you, Mr. Mayor. Yeah, that's a much, much easier second modification. Um, if you recall, the city and the county entered into an agreement in uh, 2020, uh, September, I believe it was, uh, to receive CARES Act money. There was a, um, an amount attached to that original agreement. Um, there was a first modification to that agreement um, in October of 2020 um, in order to increase the amount of money that we would receive from the county for um, the CARES Act funding. Um, since then, and that agreement became null and void uh, December 30th of 2020, uh, and since then, the CARES Act funding uh, has been extended to the end of 2021. So the second modification really doesn't change anything other than the effective date of the CARES Act funding. Uh, we, we had now have until December of um, 2020, December 30th of 2021, in order to spend that $2.9 million that 
under the original agreement with the county. So this resolution was, um, um, uh, again, the county kind of drafted this agreement for us. They have reviewed it. Um, hopefully they don't change it again. But um, I did uh, confer with, uh, uh, with uh, not only their legal staff, but the gentleman that I work with over in finance over there. Uh, they think this is a good agreement and it should stick. So um, on the table for you is to approve this resolution uh, modifying that second, uh, uh, modifying the CARES Act agreement under a second modification between the county and the city. So, thank you, Mr. Stevenson. Are there members of the public who wish to comment on this item? Well, you can now. <laughs> <laughs> okay, I still feel bad about that. Anyway, council members, do you have any questions for the city manager on this item? I do have a question. But Vice Mayor Donna. Not about the time extension. Uh, are we going to get a list or is there some idea? I mean, that's a lot of money for us to be spending. I, I'm sure there's some parameters that you are following, but I, we, you know, people say to me, what are you spending your money on? I'm like, I don't know. And I would, you know, we, at some point. The last list that we had shared with you uh -huh. has not changed. Okay. Um, that pretty much is all the money that we've spent. Uh, we did discover something today that um, that I may be able to spend some more money on that is COVID related. Mm -hmm. um, I don't know how much that is yet. We're investigating how much we're, we're looking at buying some hand washing stations. Okay, so that list is, is, is that list has not changed since the last time you have seen that list. Okay. I mean, we are still we are still working off of uh, improvements from that list. Um, we've got some improvements here at the front of City Hall. Uh, we have some other stuff that we're still working on, but it is on that list that you saw. So. We have not added anything new to that list, but if I do, I'll make sure we share it with you. So, thank you. Yes, ma'am. Other questions, council members? If not, is there a motion to approve the um, ref the uh, resolution for the second modification of the CARES Act funding agreement? Second. Motion and second. Is there discussion on the motion? If not. All those in favor, signify with aye. 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 Any nays? The funding agreement modification is approved. <clears throat> Next item on the agenda, we have a couple of items under this category is council business. Uh, first item is a lien reduction request extension update. Uh, City Attorney Pam Shishon. Thank you. Uh, the uh, lien reduction that had been approved by council uh, concerning 418 Ferncliff Avenue, um, you had approved the reduction, I believe, in January and then uh, granted one extension. The balance was, or the, the uh, reduced amount was paid before the deadline today, and the city received $6,350. The original amount was $211,040. This involved nine code cases uh, going from 2006 through 2019. So hopefully that is now done very good thank you and uh, thank you mr pregorlich if you would pass our gratitude on to the code board members for, uh, i know they've wrestled with this case for a long time so thank you next item on the agenda is reporting i'm sorry did anybody have any questions for the city attorney on this item okay next item is reporting traffic concerns to the police department chief ken albano will explain welcome chief Good evening, Mayor and members of City Council. I've been directed to clean this, so I will. Maybe. No, they're pretty good. So. We bought those under the first modification of the CARES Act. Right, 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 right. Okay, so it's, it's up. But before, before I begin the presentation, I kind of felt compelled because the topic is going to be primarily how you report traffic concerns to the police department to share a traffic concern that's been plaguing us for a few years now. Uh, it involves a, a vehicle that's affectionately been uh, nicknamed the blur by, by the witnesses who have shared this with us because this particular vehicle has the ability to seemingly disappear. It, it, they, they hear it, it flies by, they look. And they hear a swoosh, like the swoosh of wind going by. They cannot seem to identify this vehicle. But based on witness accounts, 
and utilizing our detectives, we have been able to identify and put together a profile. So based on that information, the driver of the blur is most likely a middle-aged white male who has an unhealthy fascination with speed. He is likely to be a lifelong resident of Temple Terrace, extremely familiar with our roadways, as indicated by his ability to seemingly disappear at a moment's notice. He may actually be a retiree, as the majority of the speeding complaints concerning the blur have been received during normal business hours, and an inordinately high amount of them have been tied to the conclusion of pickleball tournaments and badminton <laughs> tournaments held at our family rec center. We recently were fortunate enough to require some ring camera footage from one of our residents and utilizing some super slow motion technology, we were able to get a photograph of the vehicle we believe to be the blur. So I'm asking for help tonight. <laughs> if anybody is familiar with this vehicle and can, can possibly point me in the right direction I no so idea. I can have. I have no idea. So I can, <laughs> so I can have a, a conversation. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> so serious. Oh, hearing officer, yeah. One magistrate or three? <laughs> three. I want three now. So, no. so seriously. Yeah. I, Wait, please, uh, Chief. The glowing oh, face. Is serious. <laughs> I and and, and, and uh, council member, I was about to say th this is serious, and it's sometimes a very heavy issue to discuss. So in light of that, I wanted to do something. Everybody that knows. Uh, my former colleague and our current council member, James Chambers, knows that he's not the blur. Yeah. However, however, we have a lot of citizens that have shared with us similar accounts that would liken the driver of these speeding vehicles to exactly be that, a blur. Something that is here momentarily and disappears. Don't really, can't really provide a lot of information. I just know there's a lot of speeding and you, I need you to do something about it, Chief. I need you to do something about it. So with, with that being said, there are so many options to report concerns to us, whether it's traffic or otherwise. Um, I'm going to list a few of them. First of all, 911. If it's a traffic safety issue that, that concerns life safety, if a sinkhole, for instance, opens up and jeopardizes the life safety of the motors traveling on our, on our roadways, call 911. If it's not a life safety issue, then call the non-emergency number, 813-989-7110. Both of those numbers get you to the dispatch center. The dispatch center is staffed with trained communications officers who will assist in gathering the information, and then I'll explain a little more about how they forward it and what we do with it once it's forwarded, but forwarding it to those of us that, that can then review and and appropriately utilize the information that you've shared. We also have, as, as was shared a, a few council meetings ago, uh, text MyGov smart texting technology that you can utilize by, by texting 813-430-1660 and simply text traffic. If you do that, that will link you to the City of Temple Terrace report a concern page, which looks like that. On that page, you'll see where uh, the second line there is police department reported traffic complaint. You hit that link, that link will send you to a, a form. You complete that form and you click submit. When you submit that form, it goes, in, in the case of a traffic complaint, to our patrol commander, currently Jacob Carlisle, who will review that and ensure that that information is acted upon. The backup to that captain is my other captain, the investigations captain, so that, that there's two people that, that are charged with looking at all of those that come in through that route, no matter how it is that they get reported. To that end, City of Temple Terrace homepage, www.templeterrace.com forward slash, will also link you to that report of concern link, which will provide you with the opportunity to do the same thing I just, I just shared. Also, police department homepage at www.templeterrace.com forward slash 171 forward slash police hyphen department will also get you to that same location. So you can use that to complete those uh, complaint forms which will be routed to us for follow-up. Or you can do it the old-fashioned way. COVID has kind of restricted some of our coffee with a cop, but we still have a program that I implemented years ago where it's a park, walk, and talk. It was uh, 
originally came to my knowledge from a good friend of mine, Anthony Holloway, when he was then the police chief in Clearwater. And what that does is it, it, it's, a, it's a fallback to the old days of the beat cop, where officers will get out in the business areas and residential areas, they will walk around, they will talk to the citizens. If you see an officer doing that, or hopefully when we can resurrect the coffee with the cop program, or you see him in a store, walk up to him, share your complaint. All of the officers, all the communications personnel understand how to receive and to process and to disseminate the information that you share with us. So what happens next? Well, once we have the information, especially in uh, reference to a traffic concern, your concern with as many details as you can provide, and they're important, are placed into a traffic folder. That traffic folder is accessed by our officers every day when they come on shift night shift and day shift, because traffic complaints come in 24-7, 365. They're not all daytime, they're not all, all nighttime. So every shift, they look at those. Every shift, hopefully we have detail as far as times to focus on, but every shift they look at those, and as uh, time is available for those officers to act upon them, they do. They record their observations, they record their actions. Uh, and that's reviewed by the patrol commander. And if deemed necessary, we also have additional equipment. We have message trailers that you've seen. All of our message trailers have the ability uh, to collect traffic information and perform uh, analytical uh, reports that we can pull from them. And we also have uh, covert equipment that can be deployed from time to time, depending on what the complaint is and what we're trying to determine. Education and enforcement follows that, if warranted. If warranted, officers, not just the zone officer, but a concentrated uh, traffic wave is put together, and um, they call it Wolfpack, and they call it several different things, but several officers, you may have seen us on Fowler doing this, sometimes on 56th Street doing this, but we go out in force, suspend other operations, even though they're important, and do what we can to put an overwhelming amount of officers and visibility to whatever the complaint happens to be with the primary, primary goal to change behavior. We don't write the most citations in the world. We'll never be accused of being what Waldo used to be, not what they are now, but what they, what, what they used to be. That's never gonna happen, not on my watch. But we do write a high amount of warnings. We do issue tickets when appropriate, but we spend the time necessary to try to change that driving behavior. That's the key, that's what's important. We wanna keep our streets safe. Um, so in the end, if follow-up has been requested, and depending on the complaint, we may, we may initiate that contact, whether it was requested or not, just to provide the citizen with the, with the results of our analysis, what we determined um, that we have done, what we can show that we found out if we deployed a traffic tr feedback trailer or the, or the covert uh, device. Um, Having said that, I didn't want to step away from this without talking about speed bumps for a minute, because everybody thinks that's the cure. And the only word I have is be careful what you wish for, yeah. because the, there are unintended consequences to that, and not the least of which is um, it slows the response time of our, fire, of our larger fire apparatus. It totally eliminates your neighbors from having certain low-profile vehicles, like the blur. You simply can't... Mm -hmm. You simply can't go over speed humps like, like a higher profile vehicle can. And there's a cost associated with them, both installation and maintaining them. There's a cost associated with that. So the other thing that's involved in, in, in that whole process is it requires approval. It starts with Council Resolution 15191 and then an established 2013 procedural memorandum by the then city manager, which updated our procedures but it requires that a study be completed that involves police, it involves Troy and his people, the, our traffic engineers, to look at and study the results we get from the deployment of the equipment I told you about. The 85th percentile being a key determining factor utilized not by police, but in partnership with Troy and his team to determine what really is going on. Yeah, we see some speeds going, speeders going by, but how many speeders at a given time frame are actually excessively speeding. And so those parameters are set, it's put in the computer, it spits out data, and the decisions made by council resolution, and it's not just unique to the city of Temple Terrace, it's what DOT uses, it's what city of Tampa uses, it's what cities across the state use, 
is based on that 85th percentile. And what that is in actuality is, the definition is right there, it's the speed by which reasonable people utilize a given roadway environment. So, for instance, you may have a, a speed set at whatever the speed is, let's just say 25 miles an hour, which the city of Temple Terrace deems that's what our speed is in our residential areas, um, to include our collector streets. If the speed traveled by 85% or greater of the travelers on that roadway is in compliance plus or minus a little bit, yeah, you're probably not going to rise to the level where you're going to, in, in, in Polteris, you're not, rise to the level where this body would approve, <coughs> excuse me, the installation of speed bumps, speed humps, or any other traffic modification uh, alternatives, period. Um, that doesn't mean we can't go out and enforce. It doesn't mean we can't go out and educate. It simply means that we won't be making visible alterations to roadways or, or raising speed or lowering speeds or, or adding signs. The same thing occurs with stop signs and, and other traffic uh, uh, control devices. Chicanes, and I was told to, to say clearly, artificial curves and roadways is an alternative to speed humps that can be considered if the 85th percentile is where it needs to be. And this, again, this body, all of that would come before this body for approval before we would actually put permanent uh, roadway alterations into play. Um, 3D artwork is something very popular, growing in popularity, and can be used effectively. Uh, my personal favorite is the establishment of a Temple Terrace Police Department traffic unit. Um, there, there, are, there are certainly a lot of positive uh, outcomes from, from doing that when I could have a focused day-to-day, -day, every day, not answering calls, not doing anything other than answering traffic complaints, working in the areas over where we have the do not enters and those type of things, everything's important. And we value every complaint that comes in, but having the ability on a day-to-day -day consistent basis to address them is, is something that simply isn't our reality most days. Um, so at the end of the day, in partnership with the community, in partnership with this body, and certainly working with our city manager, we do everything we can to be as responsible as possible and responsive to the complaints of our citizenry, to those things that you share with the city manager. And, and through his direction, uh, do everything we can to help make our streets and our, and our uh, state roads as safe as possible for all travelers. And with that, I will stand for questions. We're good. Thank you, Chief. It's probably a little break with proper procedure, but we <coughs> have a few citizens here. Are there members of the public who wish to comment on this item? Council member questions. Council member Abel. Well, I would just like to, to thank the chief for making that presentation. I said something um, two weeks ago about uh, this, the issue of speeding on Whiteway. And after I said that, he called me two days later and, and talked to me for more information. And um, in addition to that, I've noticed increased enforcement. I've noticed um, several times when I've been out on Whiteway, I've seen you know, people getting pulled over and people are taking notice. Uh, the people who originally reached out to me said, hey, I'm noticing things. They, they noticed the, the board that says what the speed limit is and that there were people getting pulled over as well. So I do appreciate that. And I think that it's having the effect on um, reducing speeders. At least people, you know, have a sense that they're being watched. And I really appreciate that. So thank you. Yes, ma'am. Other questions? Council Member Chambers. Yeah, uh, thank you, Chief. Uh, the first part of the presentation was great. Uh, <laughs> thank you. But. Uh, uh, and, and to bring up how a citizen can report a concern because, and I'll use an example myself, if I'm out on the golf course or riding my bicycle through the city or driving around the city under the proper speed zone, uh, under the speed limit, yes, sir. Uh, if I'm doing that, but I can tell you there's certain times of the day I see different parts of the city, cars going fast. It's the same car, maybe on River Hills Drive, another car on Whiteway. So now if all their citizens can, you know, in their normal routine, see something like that, they have a way to report it to the police. I know you can't get to it immediately, but you've indicated how you can put it in your folder and the officers do that. And I also saw in Whiteway the extra patrols. I've seen it down uh, Inverness. I've seen it on Glenarvan. I've seen it on Bullard at different times when there's issues. So thank you. It is a problem in our city, and I, for one, would like to see a special traffic unit and something you might want to consider in as we approach budget time. 
Yeah, I, I, I see. And the other thing is uh, not so much a question and announcement. I have a car for sale uh, <laughs> right after this. So. <laughs> Member Schistler. Yes, thank you, Chief. Good presentation. I was wondering if there's some way we could take the non-blur <clears throat> portions of the presentation and put it as a public service because there's a lot of good information here, particularly with the with the with the, the PowerPoint on the the channel or however we could possibly do it so that everybody could those who aren't watching tonight they might have an opportunity to see it. And if we get asked, and we do all the time, how do we report this? We can say, this is how you do it, and you want more information, watch, watch this public service announcement once, uh, you know, wherever. Yes. If we could do that, I think that would be great for the... For we actually talked about that, uh, Council Member Sicherly, before the Council meeting and with the technology and the advancements that the City Manager, with uh, uh, Greg Polly being his his guy in charge, if you will, have established, and, and you've seen some of them. We certainly have the ability to, my understanding is to, to pull that kind of a clip minus the blur and, and to get that on the page. It, that'd be great. No, blur's got to be part of it. <laughs> <laughs> We're going to do that because we're going 90 miles an hour down right mm -hmm. but, but again, I, I really want everybody to understand we take it seriously. I, I did that simply because there's so many times it becomes a very heavy issue and, and on, on both sides. The people who, who see the speeds and they're, and they're complaining about it and the people that were stopping and unfortunately, uh, oftentimes it turns out to be not just what everybody thinks is our visitors, but our residents as well. And and you don't get a pass because you live in Temple Terrace and when you're when you're speeding and it's deemed necessary to give you a ticket. Again, we write far more warnings than we do tickets, and I'm proud of that because, again, it's changing behavior, not punishing people that we're after. Thank you. Very well, thank you very much. Yes, we appreciate it. Okay, we're still under council business. Is there any other council business held over from previous meetings? I have one item to... I'm not sure who to address it to because I don't know who's got the ball, whether it's a city attorney or a city manager. But where are we on the council rules revisions that we tabled a meeting or two ago? Um, when, when is that going to come back? Um, shortly. We, we've gone through and made some revisions to that um, based on some, some comments from a few of you. Um, <coughs> city attorney got it yesterday or today. Um, so we're trying to tweak it just a little bit, but it will be coming back to you very shortly. Okay. All right. So, sooner would be better than later. I, I mean, we're not exactly right on the heels of hurricane season, but it'll be here before we know it. So, and that's all the set council business I have. Other carryover business from previous council meetings? Okay, new business and board reports. I, I believe Vice Mayor Donahue had... Uh, Thank you. <clears throat> I've been attending the Florida League of C Cities webinars, which I have to say, you can go to a lot more of those meetings when they're on Zoom or WebEx because you can drink your coffee and, and listen to the meeting and not have to drive anywhere. And we had a wonderful presentation um, last week. Uh, and, um, and then this House Bill 403 came before us, and they talked about that at length. The presentation, he was telling us the most effective way for us to make our opinion known as elected officials. Madam Vice Mayor, may I yes. interrupt you? Could you yes. explain to the people watching what the House Bill 403 yes. is? Because we know, but they I don't. I will. House Bill 403 uh, will allow unregulation of home based businesses. So we as a city would not be able to tell you that you cannot have your home based business in your neighborhood. Uh, it would just take away the, it would take it away. In other words, if you wanted to run a business out of your house, you buy a, a license, a business license, but you could do it anywhere. And so, you know, I mean, right now we could still regulate things like uh, traffic and parking and noise, but if the guy next to me wants to repair lawnmowers and uh, make sure that they're running, he could run them all day long and I couldn't do anything about it. So this was brought to us uh, and what was told to us at the webinar was that we, if we don't speak up on things like this uh, specifically, 
the, the uh, latest, I hate to say batch because it sounds like, you know, it's not going to be around for a while, but the newest legislators, the majority of them are not former city elected officials, meaning that they don't know what home rule is. They come from agriculture, they come from a variety of businesses, and they are not and have not been trained on what home rule is. Lesson on what is home rule. Home rule was voted in by the citizens of the state of Florida to give your local elected officials power to make local decisions. But in the last, I'd say, three years, and this year seems to be the most egregious, home rule is being taken away. Now, we all know we've had several others, and we won't go into those, but he was telling us that the most effective way for us as elected, besides calling directly to our representative, which, by the way, in my attachments, his name and phone number are in red, so you all have it. Call Mr. McClure and tell him that we don't like something. Okay, He works for us just like we work for you. The next thing would be for us as a body to pass a resolution that says we are opposed to, in, our, in this case, House Bill 403. Now, it's already gone through one committee. Uh, and, you, and in your packet, you have uh, the one committee, and it's getting ready, went through the House Regulatory Committee, and the few ones in yellow are the ones who voted against it, and all the rest. So now it's gone through one committee, it's going to the second. So what they, he recommended to us was that if we pass a resolution that says, we, the elected officials, we, the city council of the city of Temple Terrace, for these reasons, believe that this would go against our citizens' right to live peacefully in a residential area, uh, that that carries a lot of clout. So the reason I brought you the handout tonight um, is so that perhaps we could direct our uh, city clerk to draft a resolution that, ju that says just that. And what he was telling us was that when he can stand, at, when it finally comes out of committee, and if it does come out of committee and, if, and it has a, a, a pair bill in the Senate, when it goes to vote, if he can say, look, I have of the 100 and plus, you know, what I think is 44 or 411 cities, if he can say, I have 100 cities who've all said this is bad business for us, that carries a lot of clout. You know, they, they all stand up and say, I've heard from cities, I've heard from people, but that is probably the, the strongest weapon we have, okay? I would encourage all of our citizens who don't, I mean, we just had a long discussion a couple of weeks ago about somebody who wanted to have a business that everybody said, no, 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 that's going to encroach on, my, on the quiet and the tranquility of my neighborhood. If this passes, we would have to say, sorry, can't do a thing about it. And, and I mean, they're not suggesting that the state would manage it. They're just saying there's no, there's no division between commercial and residential. So um, what you have before you, and of course, you know, they gave us some things that, you know, like a fireworks business. You know, my, when I wrote my letter, I suggested that uh, worst case scenario would be that you'd have an elephant trainer in the next in the next house next to you, but obviously I was just trying to get their attention. So my question is, are, do, would you be willing as a council to write a resolution that says, and you don't have to do it tonight, we, we could have it ready and take a look at it for the, at the next meeting, but I really think that, number one, we should all call because Mr. McClure, who is our representative in our district, is on the next committee, the House Commerce Committee. And it has not, it, it's headed there, it has not reached their desk as of yet. And tell them why we don't want this bill to be passed. And uh, I think we need to get in the habit <coughs> of, God bless you, of doing this type of thing um, so that we can 
you know, not all of them we're all going to agree on right away, but this one is just so obvious. I mean, it just, it makes no, there's no common sense behind it. I, and many times the Florida League will tell us why the bill was written, such and such a thing happened. I have a feeling that this is based on there are so many people working from home because of COVID. And that sounds great. If your next door neighbor is a, is a financial consultant, I'm more than happy to have him living next door to me. But if he's, uh, you know, sandblasting cemetery stones, um, I'm not interested. I, I can't imagine. Okay, I think we have it. So here's my, here's my question for city attorney and council members here. Um, I didn't know about this this one here's one of the struggles we have every year is i'm not personally i'm not a fan of passing resolutions condemning or supporting bills that i haven't had a chance to read mm -hmm. this is a kind of a summary but i like to read the actual thing because i don't know who wrote this or what you know maybe there's more to this and the other thing is that there are other bills at various stages up there who are which are equally detrimental to the city one of them that a floating around up there would preempt all municipal code enforcement from responding to an anonymous complaint so if they got an anonymous complaint that something was at a house according to my reading of the bill they wouldn't even be permitted to go by there and look at it with their own eyes to say, well, yes, it is happening at that house, right? They couldn't even respond to it, which is preposterous. I mean, it's ridiculous. I don't know if they have intelligence suckers on the doors up there or something. I don't know. But um, so there are probably other similar home rule issue bills. And here's my question. I'm kind of thinking while you were talking, I'm trying to work this out. What if we not to give you guys another project, but what if we came up with a manageable list of the ones that we feel are most egregious to home rule? Let's not wander off into every other kind of thing because then we'll just get mired in a debate that among ourselves that will never get resolved. But if we stick with things that only concern home rule, preemption of the trees, preemption of code enforcement, preemption of zoning, what you know preemption only what if we had a short list of these things and had proclamation reclam resolutions prepared right and maybe we had half a dozen of them and now we don't meet often enough these things happen quick quick in Tallahassee so if we had four or five six of these resolutions prepared if we held a special meeting just for that purpose that would be a 10 minute meeting um, we could meet if that were the only topic that would not take long we could meet at two o'clock in the afternoon or whatever works for everybody and we'd be in and out of here in 10 minutes um, and maybe get kill all these birds with one stone kind of thing and that also gives everybody an opportunity to go to the website read the bills themselves so that we really know what the actual language is and not just the synopsis so what are City manager, city attorney, council members, I'm looking for some, what do you want to do? I'm looking at our city clerk too. Everybody's looking at me. Oh, well, I'm looking I'll at I'll take the lead here. Well, we, is this a good idea or is this a waste of everybody's well, time? I mean, I, I think it's a good idea and I think, I think council needs to understand that um, bills like this, when they are up there in Tallahassee, they may get through the committee today they may get modified by the time they get to the Commerce Committee. So there's modifications that happen in these bills constantly. Um, it would be extremely time consuming for us to keep track of all this because we, we don't have anyone tracking these things. Now, the House Bill 60, the one about preemption of anonymous complaints, um, I, I got out of League of Cities that uh, um, Again, it was a summary of the bill, not the bill, but a summary of the bill that I passed on to council, just to let you know that these are the kind of things that are being discussed up in Tallahassee. They do affect our home rule. Um, the trees was a good example. Uh, we are now suffering the consequences of that. 
it's my understanding that that's supposed to be visited again, but I haven't seen any details to that. So um, I have reached out <coughs> to um, uh, Senator Burgess and, and Representative McClure to try to, I tried to meet with them before they went into session, and believe it or not, it's difficult to get, get, get even a meeting with them. But um, they have um, uh, semi-committed, and I, and I say semi-committed because I'm talking with their, their, their assistants, basically, not them specifically. Uh, but they have committed to maybe doing something virtually with me next week. So um, based on that, if I can get kind of a list of what you um, are looking to be concerned about, we can certainly not only go through a special meeting and uh, create a resolution, if you would. Um, I don't know that that's a bad idea. I think typically in the past, um, the mayor would write a letter based on direction from council. The mayor would write a, write a letter um, in opposition of any kind of bill. Um, and if you pr desire to do it a different way, we can certainly do that, Mr. Mayor. Um, it's difficult. These things change every single day. That's the biggest thing. You, 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 sometimes we're not even aware of modifications that are made to the bills. So. Well, the letter writing is an option also, but I typically do get the permission of the council before I take a position on behalf of the city. Absolutely. And your, your point to reading the bill is a very good one because there are things that are in the bill that may not even discuss yep. anonymous complaints. I mean, there may be something hitting in there that now we're in op opposition to that we're really not in opposition to. Right. So reading the bill is a very good point. Um, we could try to track down these bills if we can maybe get um, some feedback from each of you, maybe this week. We could start tracking these things uh, through, the, through the respective committees uh, and certainly giving you an update. Um, I'd be more than happy to put some time into uh, making sure that uh, we respond to some of your concerns and share that with our representatives. So, um. Council Member Chambers? Uh, yes, and that's about uh, what I was going to suggest. I mean, Florida League of Cities is the kind of clearinghouse, and they're in the forefront of home rule uh, tax. So uh, I know Council uh, Vice Mayor Donahue, uh, I think you're our rep to Florida League, to continue to work with them and the city manager work with them. To, they should have an ongoing list of bills, and, and I know one that uh, was going to deal with regional planning councils, which I sit on. That's changed three times in a week. So, uh, you know, keep an ongoing, you know, pulse of this and, and report back to us. Uh, and you know that it's changed three times this week. I don't know that. Yeah. And that's, that's, one, of the, that's one of the disconnects we have going with all the, the happenings in, in the legislature is that um, we all get a little bit of this, you know, a bit of this and a bit of this and a bit of this. There is no comprehensive overview of any of this. Okay, so how do we best accomplish our goal here? Because I think we're all in spirit, um, in agreement yeah. with the vice mayor. I think what we're struggling with is now what to do with that. I, I just want to say the reason we belong to the Florida League of Cities is that they've done the research for us. They don't talk about bills. I mean, there are awful lot of bills out there, and they're not the ones you read in the newspaper are not necessarily always on their list because their list focuses on home rule. So, you know, I, I would hate for you and staff to start having to track bills and what have you when, when um, the league sends out that notification once a week. And if something happens quickly, they send you a text. I get a text message. So, um, you know, and usually there, I have to say, I did read this bill, and their synopsis is right on target. Um, and, you know, they, they put some talking points here that are attention grabbers, okay? I mean, in particular, this one says, you know, different businesses that could immediately open next door, it would be a fireworks business. Well, okay, that's... I mean, they, obviously, they, they came okay. up with the so most Okay, so why don't we do so this? So my point is I don't want to have staff doing what Florida League of Cities, okay. so how can we okay. well, I, I, shorten I, that I, path? We can shorten things considerably, I think. Yeah. If you feel so inclined, mm -hmm. you could at this point make a motion to have the council do one of two things. 
we could pass a resolution or, or direct city clerk to draft a resolution that we would then have to reconvene to pass, mm -hmm. or you guys could make a motion and make a vote to empower me and to write a letter on the, on the city's behalf, which I would do if the council directs me to do that. You could do that right now. If you're that confident on this bill, now you got to get the vote of three people here to mm -hmm. make that work. Um, I, I mean, I don't haven't read the bill, but I read what the synopsis is. So, well, the advice given to me, and so I will make the motion, is to move that we, as a council, draft a resolution specifically addressing our concern over the ramifications of House Bill 403. We have a motion. Do we have a second? I second that motion. Okay. Is there discussion on the motion? I have a question for the city attorney. Is this motion enough to draft a resolution that is pre-approved? Or do we have to come back now and vote on the resolution once it's in printed form? Right. This, this sounds like a motion to draft a resolution, but once the resolution is drafted, you would have to approve that resolution. So, so they will either give you time then to read the text of the bill yeah. yourself okay. and make an informed decision to approve the resolution. Okay. And then we would have to either do A, vote on the resolution at our next scheduled meeting, or B, call a special meeting to vote on that resolution. True. And okay. if you want to just include that one, that's fine. You mentioned Senate Bill 60. Well, we have one motion right now. Okay. I didn't know if you wanted to amend it to include that one, too. Don't forget there's the short-term rental one is out there floating around right now. They're tampering with that one the again. List is this long. So, yes. <laughs> so I didn't know if you wanted to maybe <laughs> consider putting the ones we, I mean, yes, there are many, but we know of at least four right now. So if you want to include all of them in one resolution or do them separately or just tackle the one. What, what are the four that you're referring to? There's the. Well, the, the, the House Bill 403, there's Senate Bill 60, which is the code enforcement one. There is the short term rental one. And there is also the tree one. But that one would not be opposing. That one would be supporting the repealer. The, the House bill and the Senate bill, which are repealer bills. So it would be three opposings and one supporting. Okay. Those are the ones that come to my mind. The, the city manager might know of some other ones right now, so. Those are the four that I've written down. Yeah. <laughs> okay, now I have two people in line to speak here. Mr. Sister is wanting to ask a question or make a comment on the motion. We have a motion on the table. Prior to recognizing him, you're the maker of the motion. Do you want to modify and expand the motion or do you want to leave it as it is because it may change what Mr. Schistler has to say? At this point, I would like to leave it as it is because okay. this one is going into its second committee. Okay. Mr. Schistler, you're recognized. Okay. Um, <clears throat> thank you. Uh, I believe, though, that we need to – I'll support the motion. I understand. It. And we, we, we'll still have an opportunity to read the bill. Um, before it comes back for the actual final vote. <clears throat> but um, I would like to afterwards move forward with, with doing the other three. I think it's important that we get even, I know it's four separate resolutions, but if we, hit, we issue a blanket resolution or a blanket motion, well, they go, well the other committees aren't going to care. That, you know, if, if, if it goes to the Commerce Committee, they may not cover the tree ordinance issue. And I don't want to dilute the impact of our resolution by having a whole laundry list of things in there. So, well, they're just doing a shotgun approach. I, if we're going to be specific, and I think we should be, we, I'm, I'm going to be targeted, then we need specific resolutions addressing um, specific issues. And however we deal with it whether it's at the next meeting or a subsequent meeting or at a special meeting we all live five minutes away okay so i think that I, I agree with that but i will support the motion for this particular bill um giving us an opportunity to reread it or to read it afterwards but i i, I would like to go further beyond that and, and need to do the others afterwards very good my, my comments to the motion maker are this 
not a, you made the motion. It's up to you to make whatever motion you deem appropriate. I would, had I made the motion, I would expand this to give directive to create a draft resolution for each of these that we know of. Right? These are the four that we know of right off the top of our head. We haven't passed these resolutions until the next time we meet. We can we don't lose two weeks by doing this. If if we read these bills and we read the draft of the resolution and we don't like it, they don't ever get approved. But we we can get this knocked out, and that way the next time we meet on these resolutions, we've got them. Otherwise, we wait two weeks. Now you make a motion to draft resolutions on these other three things. We've lost a month. I, I just want to make sure that each resolution will be dedicated to a bill. Correct. In that case, well, I'm, you make the motion. That's no, a but, but, but if I understand you, that's a great idea, and I'd be more than happy to modify my motion, as long as we know that they they go as a standalone at the appropriate time. Just like Mr. Schistel said. You, you would hate to send one and it just like, they're like, oh yeah, and by the way, they don't like this, this, this. Madam this. Vice Mayor, you make the motion. Okay, then I'm making You can the, say that. Yes, I, <laughs> <laughs> All right. I amend my motion to ask staff to draft four separate resolutions with the, with the bills we mentioned specifically tonight um, to be prepared for our discussion. To, to be at our disposal in the future. Does that make it? Yes, make City it Attorney, you're clear on the four that she's referring to. Yes. There's a motion, is there a second? A revised motion, is there a second? Second's got to do it. We yes. have uh, a modified motion. Do we have a second to the modified motion? Yes. You have to say it. Yes. Yes, second. Okay, so we have a second by Council Member Abel. Is there discussion on the modified motion? If not, all those in favor signify with aye. 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 Any opposed? No nays. These resolutions, once they're crafted, please send the drafts out to us. If in the meantime you see these are moving faster than our meeting allows, then signal that to somebody and we'll call a special meeting and we'll vote on them. Okay? Fair enough? Okay. Any other new business and board reports? Mr. Chambers. Uh, uh, new business, but uh, just a shout out of thanks to Brian in the booth back there. I don't know if you guys noticed the last two meetings, we've had an upgrade in our video. We've got uh, split screen going. That's neat, and I know uh, uh, Brian's worked hard on making that happen to help with our communication efforts. So thank you, Brian, back there. I did notice that, and uh, thank you for bringing it up. Thank you, Brian. Any other new business board reports? One quick thing, um, I know we're running late, is I have my second Cultural Assets Commission meeting this Friday. Just to remind you, that is a county board that the mayor, the mayors have seats on. Well, let me take that back. I have a seat on it, and I know Plant City Mayor, I, I don't know if Mayor Castor sits on it or not. I haven't seen her. But um, that is the commission that awards um, tax money grants to civic events, parades, art festivals, music festivals, those types of things. And, and we rank those um, proposals and money is given to them based on how much money there is and what rank they receive. And so we vote on that. Um, I, it's a quarterly meeting. We do this once a quarter. I spoke with the city manager again today about this. This is not something the city can get. The recipients of these grants have to be a charitable organization. They have to be, mm -hmm. you know, a 501c something. And, um, but we need to dig into this and get some of our charitable organizations on board because I can tell you that some projects that are receiving funding are not much different than some of the things we have going on here in the city. Mm -hmm. Fireworks, arts, count, arts festivals, craft beer festival, those are the kinds of things that are receiving uh, partial funding. I mean, they don't pay for the whole thing, but they, they receive partial funding for these things. Um, now, it has to be something that goes, is run by a charitable organization. The city can't run the fireworks and apply for this because we can't do it. So 
more to come on that, but you might want to look that up on the Hillsborough County website. There's a link to the Cultural Assets Commission, and you can see the kinds of things that are funded, partially funded. County money or state money? County money. To my, well, I, I say that. That's my understanding. Yeah, okay. it, it is a county board, and I believe it's county money. Um, and a lot of the money goes to big Tourism events in dollar. Tampa, the Gasparillas, you know. Is it the tourism, the old tourism board? or is You know, I don't want to say on the record what the funding source is because I'm not 100% certain whether it's TDC. I'm not sure. I don't think it's bed tax money, but it might be. Yeah, I don't think it is either, but I don't want to say that because I could be wrong. That means there's two pots out there. Yeah. So, and that's all that I have under new business. Anybody else? Okay, city manager. Oh, thank you, Mr. Mayor. I don't have anything to share with council this evening. Thank you. Good. All right. City Attorney. I have one thing. Um, as you all know already, on February the 25th, the Florida Supreme Court issued its opinion in the transportation surtax case that was brought by County Commissioner Stacy White against the county, the three cities in Hillsborough County, Hart, and a couple other entities, including one which had the 1% sales tax uh, initiative put on the ballot. Um, the uh, the approval of this um, initiative on the ballot became a county charter amendment and the court held that the amendment was in conflict with Florida Statute 212 which states that only the county commission can determine uh, how the collected monies are distributed. The measure approved by the public contained a distribution list of who and how, how much and for what, and the court held that if the distribution plan was removed from the question, um, they could not be sure that the public would still have voted for it, so they invalidated the entire thing. Um, one justice dissented. Um, the question, though, on everybody's mind, though, is what happens now to the money that has been collected so far? The court, the Supreme Court, did not state that it needed to be returned. It sort of left that question untouched. Um, it did not send the case back to the lower court to do anything to make a refund of the money happen. Nevertheless, the defendants, along with the Florida Department of Revenue and the county clerk's office, are discussing a possible claim procedure that would go through the court. This is just a beginning of this discussion. Nothing yet had been has been decided at all. Um, in fact, right now, the decision of the court still is not final because the, we're still in the rehearing window. Um, so all I can tell you right now is that nothing yet has been determined, um, and I will certainly give an update to council as soon as I learn more. I expect that there'll be more discussions uh, amongst the defendants and the Department of Revenue on how this is going to work. Good. Yep. Questions on this item? It created a mess. Mm -hmm. Yep. Yes, sir. Okay. Anything else, Mr. Sean? Very good. Is there other business to come before the council tonight? City manager, city clerk, city attorney, Mr. Mueller, public. If not, we are adjourned.